The senators seemed unimpressed. Perhaps it was because they already knew too much. Each senator arriving with a fat, orange-colored notebook crammed with classified material about the CIA, all marked top secret. After five months of closed-door investigation, of talking in private with intelligence agents and officials, most of the senators now agree with Chairman Frank Church that the CIA has indeed been a rogue elephant out of control. So the testimony of Colby didn't allay the suspicions. The hearings took place in the historic Senate caucus room, scene of the dramatic Watergate investigation just two years ago. The press was back in great numbers today, but not the public. There were, in fact, no long lines, and the seats reserved for the audience were at times only two-thirds filled. As someone said, after what has happened in this country during the past two years, there are no more future shocks. But whether there are shocks or not, today's open hearing did focus major attention on the way the CIA has gone about its business in the United States. The subject today concerns CIA's involvement in the development of bacteriological warfare materials with the Army's Biological Laboratory at Fort Detrick. CIA's retention of, a num of an amount of shellfish toxin and CIA's use and investigation of various chemicals and drugs. The relationship between the CIA and the Army Biological Laboratory at Fort Detrick as an activity requiring further investigation surfaced in late April of this year. It resulted from information provided by a CIA, CIA officer not directly associated with the project in response to my repeated directives that all past activities which might now be considered questionable be brought to the attention of agency management. Information provided by him and by two other officers aware of the project indicated that the project at Fort Detrick involved the development of bacteriological warfare agents, some lethal, and associated delivery systems suitable for clandestine use. A search was made for any records or other information available on the project. This search produced information about the basic agreement between the Army and the CIA relating to the project and some limited records covering its activities from its beginning in 1952 to its termination in 1970. In the course of the investigation, CIA's laboratory storage facilities were searched, and about 11 grams, a little less than half an ounce, of shellfish toxin and 8 milligrams of cobra venom were discovered in a little-used, vaulted storeroom in an agency building. A major early requirement of the agency was to find a replacement for the standard cyanide L-pill issued to agents in hazardous situations during World War II. This was the basis on which eventually we discovered the to shellfish toxin. The only application of this toxin was in the U-2 flight over the USSR in May 1960, during which Gary Powers carried such a device car concealed in a silver dollar. In the Powers case, the grooves of, the, of the, the, the drill were filled with shellfish toxin. He obviously did not use it and was not instructed to do so. It was offered to him to provide him with an option. The Powers flight was the only time we are aware that the toxin was provided for operational use, although the L-pill was made available for earlier flights. The primary agency interest was in the development of dissemination devices to be used with standard chemicals off the cell, shell. Various de dissemination devices, such as a fountain pen dart launcher and an engine head bolt designed to release when heat <coughs> appeared to be peculiarly suited for, agent for clandestine use. Available records do not indicate that all specific items were developed exclusively for the CIA, as work on similar devices was also done for the Army. At the time the toxin was found, the officer responsible for the project in 1970 stated that he had no recollection as to how it got there. On the 30th of June, discussions were held with a retired agency officer who had provided the initial lead. This man, who had been the GS-15 branch chief in 1970, stated that the toxin had in fact been moved from Fort Detrick and stored in the laboratory. This was done on the basis of his own decision after conversations with the responsible project officer. He further stated that he made this decision based on the fact that the cost and difficulty of isolating the shellfish toxin were so great that it simply made no sense to destroy it, particularly when there would be no future source of such toxin. The current branch chief believes this explanation is correct, but still does not recall the actual act of receiving the material from Fort Detrick. 
Both of these middle grade officers agree that no, no one, including their immediate superior, was told of the retention of the shellfish toxin. If that amount of shellfish toxin were administered orally, which is one of the least efficient ways for administering it in terms of its lethality, that quantity was sufficient to kill at least uh, 14,000 people. If it were administered uh, with the sophisticated uh, equipment that was found in the laboratory, that quantity would be sufficient to kill a great many more. Estimates vary upwards into the hundreds of thousands. Now, my first question is why did the agency prepare a shellfish toxin for which there is no practical antidote, which attacks the nervous system and brings on death very quickly. Why did the agency prepare toxins of this character in quantities sufficient to kill many thousands of people. What was the need for that in the first place, long before the presidential order came down to destroy this material? I think the, uh, the first uh, part of the answer to that question, Mr. Chairman, is the, the fact that the L pill, which was developed and, and during World War II, does take some time to work and is particularly agonizing to the subject who uses it. Uh, the, some of the people who would be natural uh, requesters of such a capability for their own protection and the protection of their fellow agents really would not want to face that kind of a fate. But if they could be given an instantaneous one, they would uh, accept that. And that was the thought process behind developing the capability. Now, I cannot uh, explain why that quantity was developed, except that this was a collaboration that we were engaged in with the United States Army uh, and we did develop this particular weapon, you might say, as a possible, uh, for possible use. Now, when CIA retained the amount that it did, it obviously did it improperly. This quantity, um, and the various devices for administering the toxin, that were found in the laboratory certainly make it clear that purely defensive uses were not um, what the agency uh, had, had uh, was limited to in any way. There were definite offensive uses. In fact, there were dart guns. You mentioned suicide. Well, I, I, I don't think a, a suicide is usually accomplished with a dart. Uh, particularly a gun that can, can uh, place the dart in a human target in such a way that he doesn't even know that he's been hit. There's no question about it. It was also for offensive reasons. No question. Have you brought with you um, some of those devices which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for... We have indeed. ...for killing people? <laughs> I wonder if, if no. does does this does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. The uh, that the round thing at the top is obviously the sight. The rest of it is uh, what is practically a, uh, a normal 45, although it's, a, it's special. It, however, it, it works by electricity. There's a battery in the handle, and it fires a small dart. 
so that when it fires, it fires silently? Almost silently, yes. Uh, very little. Very what little. range does it have? 100 meters. 100 meters, I believe, about. About 100 yards, 100 meters. About 100 meters range. Right. And the dart itself, when it strikes the, the, the uh, target, um, does the uh, target know that he's, about, that he's been hit and about to die? That depends, Mr. Chairman, on the particular dart used. There are different kinds of these flechettes uh, that were used in, in uh, various weapon systems, and a special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. Without perception. Right. And did you find such such darts in the library in, in, in the laboratory? We did. Yes. Isn't it true too that um, the the effort not only involves designing a gun that could strike a, a human target? without knowledge of the person who'd been struck, but also the toxin itself would not appear in the autopsy? Well, there, there was an attempt to... Or the to dark? Make, yes, so that uh, there was no, no way of perceiving that the, uh, the target was hit. As a murder instrument, that's about as efficient as you can get, isn't it? It, it, it is a weapon, a very serious weapon. This record seems to disclose an additional concession, namely uh, the lack of accountability, so that we not only have a secret agency, but we have an agency which, about which there's some question as to its accountability to the authority of the President or to the authority of the National Security Council. Uh, the record seems to disclose uh, that there is no Presidential or Security Council order in the first place directing the uh, CIA to establish this program at all. Secondly, there appears to be no report by the CIA to higher authority of the existence of these toxins or biological weapons. <laughs> so, thirdly, there seems to be no evidence that those in charge of the CIA inquired of subordinates as to the existence of toxins or biological weapons or that following the presidential order decreeing the destruction of such toxins, that any formal order went forth within the CIA to require their destruction. Moreover, the record seems to uh, support the notion that it was only by chance that the leadership of the CIA became aware some years later of even the existence of these uh, lethal toxins which were in violation of a direct presidential order. In short, uh, the record's a mess, and we may never know just exactly what happened. No one has interviewed Gottlieb as to why he destroyed the material or what they contain, the records. No, I, I did, we have not uh, interviewed him as okay. to the reason. Do you know what, material, what documents he destroyed? We're very unsure as to the total. We do not have an inventory of them. Do you think they might have said who it was authorized the formulation or the retention of this stuff? Do you have any reason to think it might or might not contain that information? In this case, I, I doubt that it would have very much because this uh, case indicates, from the evidence we have at hand... Does it say it anything, is, have any reason to think that it might say how, if at all, this material was used in an aggressive way against someone to kill someone? Well, there may well be some of that. In, in the when, was the, when was the documentation destroyed? In 1973. In the it didn't happen to be destroyed at the same time those tapes. That's 1972. 1972. 1972. Right. When in 1972? In November, I believe it was. In November of 72. Right. Do you have any idea what volume of records were destroyed? I do not know. Do you know who authorized the destruction, if anyone? As I said, there was a memorandum of agreement between the the uh, director and, and Mr. Gottlieb at that time. And the director at that time was? Mr. Helms. Mr. Helms is here in this room, I believe, Mr. Chairman, and I take it we'll have an opportunity to hear from him Mr. today. Mr. Helms will be, uh, will be our witness uh, tomorrow morning's uh, hearings. I believe he's the lead-off witness. <laughs> uh, I won't prolong my 
opportunity to examine the witness much longer, Mr. Chairman. I understand we're going to try to operate under the 10-minute rule. May I ask you only this other question, then, in general, Mr. Colby? You've heard of the doctrine of plausible deniability. Yes, and I've rejected it uh, now, Senator. I say that uh, we cannot depend upon that anymore. The question I was going to put to you, is that a phrase of art in the intelligence community? Does it have a, a separate significance that you understand? It uh, was a rationale used uh, in earlier years. What does it if mean? If the United States could deny something and not be uh, clearly demonstrated as, uh, as having uh, said something falsely, then the United States could do so. In the case of assassinations, in the case of uh, any other of domestic surveillance, in the case of the formulation of poisons, under that previous rationale, would the doctrine of plausible deniability have led the agency to destroy records, to conceal evidence, or to compartmentalize to the point where it would be un a committee such as this later would have been unable to establish what really happened? I think the plausible denial concept was used in, in the sense of international diplomatic relationships. That, uh, Are you saying country, by that that it would not have applied to the formulation of toxic materials? I would not say that it didn't have anything to do with it at all, but I think that the basic rationale for the doctrine of plausible denial was so that our nation could deny something and not be, uh, and not be tagged with it. Colby, can you be absolutely sure that there aren't other vaults containing poison somewhere in this town or in this country or in our possession some, in some part of the world? I can't be absolutely sure, no, Senator. I, we obviously are, are to conducting such investigations and have issued such orders as are possible, but I cannot be absolutely sure that some officer somewhere has not sequestered something. Could you, as concisely as possible, state for the committee your understanding of the practice of compartmentization? Well, the compartmentation uh, practice is merely the, the strict application of the need-to-know principle. If uh, an employee in the intelligence business needs to know something in order to do his job, then he has a right to the information. But if he does not need to know that particular information, he does not have a right to, it, to the information. And uh, if the information is one which is which is required for large numbers of employees, well, then large numbers of employees will be allowed to know it. If the, if the particular activity is a very sensitive matter and only a very few employees need to know it, then it will be known to only a very few employees. We make a particular effort to keep the identi identities of our sources and some of our more complicated technical systems restricted very sharply in the, in the, to the people who actually need to work on them, and many of the rest of the people in the agency know nothing about them. Does that need to know principle apply in cases of sensitivity to the director of central intelligence? Certainly not. It does not, with one exception. Uh, I do not believe I need to know the name of an agent in some foreign country who's serving us at the risk of his life. I know he's there. I know what kind of a person he is, but I do not know to need to know his actual name, and I have kept uh, that out of my, my knowledge because I travel and I don't want to know that kind of a thing. But that's the only area that uh, I would apply it to. I, I am responsible for everything that happens in the agency. I need to know everything that happens in the agency. We've spoken rather extensively here about apparent lack of clear lines of control and authority running downward and commensurate clear lines of responsibility and accountability running upward. To the best of your knowledge, has there been any pervasive non-compliance in the matter of orders from directors to the president or orders from the DCI on the part of subordinates? In other words, has this uh, reached a greater proportion than might even have uh, been revealed here as a result of our discovery of a very, I think, significant in instance of, of insubordination? If indeed it has been pervasive, isn't there a need for much tighter controls at the top? Senator Tower, I believe that uh, we are really, uh, we have in CIA a very tight discipline. I'm not saying it's total, obviously. It uh, did not work in this case. 
But I think with the people scattered around the world doing very sensitive work, doing highly compartmented work, uh, there has been indeed a very high sense of discipline in the organization and a high sense of compliance to the, the regulations and the rules and the directives of the organization. And I think that uh, the leadership of the organization has always felt very much subject to direct presidential control and uh, responsive to it. So you would say, actually, that this incident uh, is an exception to the rule, that ordinarily the discipline has been good, that the, that the control has worked and the accountability has worked in the way that it should, according to proper cardinals of good administration. In the, uh, in the business in which we are in, the intelligence and covert act operations, I think there have been very few cases in which the agency has, or its employees, have done something that they should not have. And in many of the cases which we now question, we find that, that those activities were approved by the, uh, by the appropriate authorities at that time, that the sense of discipline within the organization seemed to be quite tight. <coughs> Senator Goldwater. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only have one question, Mr. Colby, but I have a short statement I'd like to make to you. Criticism and analysis are important ingredients in making our democracy work. However, we are now approaching the point where both are being abused to the point of self-destruction. I submit we must get out of the morass of doubt and pessimism into which we have sunk. We must not let the quarrels of the past interfere with building for the future. A tidal wave of criticism has swept over the intelligence community of our country, much of which is mistaken or unwarranted. The damage is severe. If continued, its survival is uncertain. Before this committee have appeared men of the CIA, both on active duty and retired. All have been impressive because of their dedication and loyalty. Nothing we have heard detracts from the reputation of the CIA as a highly competent organization. The men and women of the CIA are doing a great job under very trying conditions. And I say to them, as our nation gets back on course, I, I believe there will be change for the better and ask you to hold on until that happens. You are never more needed by this country than right now. And as one American, I'm proud of you. To those young people who may be looking for careers and who have a desire for public service, I th can think of no better way to serve your nation than as an intelligence officer. Many skills are required to keep the CIA a, a useful and productive organization. Continuity is vital uh, to America. Now, Mr. Colby. Senator Goldwater, if I may, on behalf of our employees, thank you for that statement. They are under a lot of pressure these days, and they will appreciate that. Well, the question I have to ask you, have other countries developed uh, bacterial warfare ability. Oh, certainly, uh, Senator. We, that is one aspect of bacteriological warfare that uh, the President's directive in 1969 and 70 tells CIA to continue, and that is to follow the activities of other nations. Uh, we will see the capabilities and activities of other nations in this field. And we have some officers who do follow this, uh, abro these activities abroad, and uh, they are quite, uh, quite general. There are some very very dubious areas where we're just not sure of what the actual capabilities are in some respects. But we do follow it indeed, and there is extensive effort uh, done by, by other nations in this line. But you are now prevented from... No, we can follow the foreign ones. Uh, that is no problem. Them, but can you do anything to offset them? Well, I think the defense, uh, the defense of, against those possible things is a matter for the Department of Defense, Senator. You, you feel you're safe in that field? Well, I think in collaboration with the Department of Defense and advising the Department of Defense <coughs> of foreign developments in this area, uh, we are giving them the basis for developing such defensive efforts as we need. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Goldwater. Senator Morgan. Chairman, Mr. Kobe, since this is the first public hearing of this committee, I think we should note that uh, we feel, and I certainly feel, that the role played by the Central Intelligence Agency is a very vital one and a very important one. I think the fact that you quoted from President Kennedy, who said that quite often our uh, 
failures are trumpeted and our successes go unheralded is appropriate here. This committee has been told by witnesses that had the Central Intelligence Agency existed prior to World War II, Pearl Harbor might never have happened. Or if it had happened, the loss of and deaths and property might have been much less. So I want you to know that we do recognize the role of the Central Intelligence Agency. We recognize the fact that we in this country must be able to know in advance what our potential adversaries and potential enemies uh, may be planning so that we can cope with them. So uh, I do think that, that it is important. I believe, Mr. Colby, Thank most you, of the questions have been asked, except that earlier the reference, reference was made to the presidential order, and we alluded to what was, in fact, I think, the press release concerning the presidential order. But as I read the presidential order, I find that the United, uh, this statement, the United States bacteriological and biological programs will be confined to research and development for defensive purposes, immunization, safety measures, etc. This does not preclude research into those offensive aspects of bacteriological, biological agents necessary to determine what defensive measures are required. Now, earlier you stated you thought it might have been the mentality of those who made the decision to keep these toxins that they might be needed in order to develop defensive weapons. Do you think if that was their thinking that it uh, would be in keeping with the presidential order as I just read it to you? Well, we looked at that. I think that you might be able to make a case for that uh Senator, if you were uh, actively involved and had responsibilities for these defensive measures. But uh, as I think the chairman pointed out, the quantities uh, maintained by CIA are difficult to defend under that directive. What was your position with the CIA at that time, Mr. Colby? Uh, in 1970, I was on, on uh, detached service. I was, uh, uh, I was assigned to the Department of State in Vietnam. Then you had nothing to do with retaining these toxins? No, I had nothing. And uh, you knew nothing about them until you made the... Until we discovered it this uh, in, in May. I, uh, I would commend you, Mr. Colby, again, for taking these steps to determine what has happened. Uh, I think most men in the CIA, as well as those in the Internal Revenue Service and the Federal Bureau of Investigation are dedicated public officials and want to do what is right. And I think your method of asking for any known violations has been helpful to this committee. And I would commend it, Mr. Chairman, to the Internal Revenue Service, to the end that they might ask uh, their field agents if they know of known violations uh, in this area. And I would commend it also to the Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Senator Goldwater mentioned, and I believe the presidential order directed the CIA to continue to maintain surveillance of the bacteriological and biological warfare capabilities of other states. You say you have done that? We do so, yes, sir. Are you in a position to tell this committee whether or not other states, and especially potential adversaries or enemies, now have stockpiles of such toxins? I don't think I can say much about stockpiles, but I do know that there are uh, installations which appear to us to be uh, experimental uh, stations of some sort. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, with the In the chemical field, uh, certainly there are stockpiles. We are aware of that also. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mathias. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Colby, some of America's greatest victories and some of America's greatest defeats have represented failures of intelligence. Trenton and Antietam, Pearl Harbor, I think all illustrate uh, the vital necessity of intelligence. 
A year ago, just almost exactly a year ago, when Senator Mansfield and I introduced the legislation which has resulted in this investigation, we had that very much in mind. We wanted to be sure that we had the best intelligence system which was available. But I think we also had in mind uh, John Adams' warning that a frequent recurrence to the principles of the Constitution is absolutely necessary to preserve the advantages of liberty and to maintain a free government. I think the discovery of this toxin raises uh, some interesting questions which are within the purview of this investigation and which I think have to be answered uh, before this committee completes its work and makes its recommendations to the Congress. Uh, for example, I accept your statement that this toxin was never used except in the one instance that you've described. But I then have to ask you this. If you had used the toxin, what provision of the Constitution would have afforded authority to do so? Well, I think uh, CIA's operations are certainly overseas operations. Uh, they fall under the National Security Act of 1947, and they fall consequently under the provisions of the Constitution that uh, call for the, the national defense and the foreign relations of the United States. But the use of a toxin of this sort is, of course, a use of force, wouldn't you agree? It's a weapon. It's a weapon. Yes. It's a use of force. And uh, normally, if a force is to be employed, against another nation, uh, congressional approval is uh, required. Isn't that true? Well, I think we're now uh, in the midst of the War Powers Act, uh, Senator, and uh, this uh, activity, of course, preceded that. Yes, it did pre precede it. Uh, but what occurs to me here is that we have an illustration of the use of force relations of the United States with other powers in the world, or at least the potential use of force. It's, as you say, it's never been used in this instance, um, which differs only in degree from uh, covert operations in Laos or other examples that we could think of. And so it seems to me that the discovery of this toxin raises very fundamental questions about the, uh, the relationship to the covert activities of any intelligence agency, be it the CIA or the FBI or, or others, uh, with the constitutional process by which this government uh, is conducted. And I would think, Mr. Chairman, that there is uh, no responsibility greater upon us than to define that relationship as accurately as possible before the close of these hearings. Thank you. It is, of course, uh, uh, contained within the amendment to the Foreign Assistant Act uh, passed last December, which uh, now requires that any activity of CIA other than <coughs> intelligence gathering abroad shall be uh, found to be important to the national security by the president and shall be reported to the appropriate committees, and that includes six committees of the Congress at this time. This is a statutory provision which we are in compliance with. And, and let me say, Mr. Colby, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, let me say that this imposes responsibilities on the Congress that I don't think we've always discharged very well. Uh, I, I can recall uh, members of Congress who uh, uh, recoiled from responsibility of knowing what was happening. Members of Congress who said, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Now, I think that is an indictment of the Congress, uh, just as severe as any indictment which is labeled against any of the intelligence community. I wouldn't call it an indictment of the Congress, Senator. I think it rather reflected the 
general atmosphere and political atmosphere toward intelligence that, uh, that was the traditional approach. And I think we Americans are changing that. And, well, and I, this, this act is, a, is an example of that change, as is this committee. I think you're more uh, generous than, than I'm inclined to be. I can't be that permissive. Uh, I don't think climate uh, will excuse uh, what is really a dereliction of duty. And if there had not been that dereliction of duty, perhaps we wouldn't be here today. I must say, Senator Mathias, that I agree fully that we have been victimized by excessive secrecy, not only with respect to the failure of the Congress in the past to exercise proper surveillance over intelligence activities, uh, but also uh, excessive secrecy has created this kind of mischief within the executive branch. Here we have a case where the very methods of secrecy uh, concealed for five years an act of insubordination within the CIA uh, that came to light only by the happenstance that Mr. Colby, the present director, asked the agency if they please wouldn't tell him what's been going on that's wrong. And as a result, somebody, knowing something about this, gave him a tip as a result of which he then conducted an investigation that led to these disclosures. So I believe that the internal uh, workings uh, within the agency itself are uh, a matter that we must look at very closely to be sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again if it can be prevented. Uh, excessive secrecy uh, may have victimized this agency as well as the Congress.